we are going to, to the next, next talk, and after that we are going to the round table that uh, I'm sure is going to be really, really productive. I would uh, like to introduce you Dr. John Hickey from the Rosalie Institute, uh, and I apologize because I, I wrote, uh, I misspelled the, the, the Rosalie Institute, there is no G at the end. So uh, it's in the program and in everything that's in press, uh, printed. Sorry about that. Uh, he is from Ireland, but he's working in Scotland, and he's in agriculture, agriculture, agriculture science, and he's one of the very young and brilliant guys that's going to give us a very interesting talk. Thank, thank you, Bento. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come to, come to Brazil. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that there are a lot of people that have uh, made contributions to the work that I'll present. Uh, I, won't list, I won't say their names, but they're all listed there. And uh, I, I would also like to remind ourselves that it, we're, this is a really exciting time for agriculture. Agriculture is really trendy, and I think it's increasingly seen as a real full member of the high-tech industry. And, and I just picked some examples that kind of support this argument. So, Microsoft is hiring, or a few months ago was hiring, a global lead position in agriculture, which they were putting in at a relatively senior level within their organization. At the same time, Amazon Web Services were also hiring an international lead in, in agriculture. Uh, Alison gave, us, gave a talk at a conference a few, a few weeks ago, the World AgriTech Forum, which had 1,300 different companies participating. And if you look at some of the of the logos of some of the headline sponsors, you start to see companies that traditionally were not involved in agriculture, like Airbus or Amazon or um, IBM, etc. And I think this is really uh, evidence that agriculture is increasingly seen as, as a high-tech industry and is, the, is something that the major organizations want to get to be, 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 be part of. Uh, so my talk has, is going to have a few different aspects. I'll talk a little bit about the integration of plant and animal breeding and how we can take tools and strategies from both fields and deploy them in the other field. I'll talk a little bit about the integration of quantitative and molecular genetics and their integration with reproductive technologies. And then I have some ideas that are of relevance to the global north and the global south as we think about um, vanishing world hunger. Uh, so animal and plant breeding have the same aims, but they have a uh, diverged somewhat over the years because of different biological or logistical constraints that are placed upon the different species. So animals, due to various reasons, have emphasized what I would call quantitative optimization of breeding decisions. And over the past 30 years, there has been a big emphasis in plant breeding around about the biology, perhaps because of, of the genetically modified organisms and the fact that they could use that technology. However, there are huge synergies that could be exploited by putting these two communities together, which have traditionally operated at some distance from each other. Uh, speaking selfishly, as an animal breeder, plant breeding is about 10 times bigger, so there's a lot of investment, a lot of human capital that could be harnessed and utilized from plant breeding to, to advance animal breeding. As you move between two fields and you uh, are trained, let's say, as an animal breeder with certain dogmas that are really important in that field, and you move into plant breeding, which have different sets of dogmas, you're equipped to challenge the norms, and, and this challenging of the norms is what d drives uh, disruptive innovation in our fields. Uh, genomic selection is making plant breeding look like animal breeding, and I think genome editing is going to make animal breeding look a little bit like plant breeding, particularly if we think about the, the, the change in the IP landscape that could emerge around about the ownership of targets for CRISPR or for gene editing. Or as Alison mentioned earlier on today, the concept of surrogate sire technology and its deployment in animal breeding programs could end up with an animal and plant breeding program looking very similar to each other. Uh, so in all breeding programs, we have basically two simple steps. We have a, a population improvement step and we have a product development step. The population improvement step involves selecting, crossing, testing, selecting, crossing, testing, and repeating that process as quickly and as accurately as possible to increase the mean of the population. And then periodically, the breeder can extract a product from this improved population and test it and disseminate it in some way. And it doesn't matter whether you're an animal breeder or a plant breeder or what species you're working in, everybody basically follows that same idealized process. But we place different emphasis on the different components of this process. So we, traditionally in animal breeding, we had this um, 
uh, pyramid structure where at the top we have our breeding program in the form of a nucleus population and currently we rapidly recycle that program, that population using uh, genomic selection to improve the mean of the population. And then we extract from that some individuals, we multiply them, we again multiply them again to produce the, the production animals which get grown. And there are millions of genetically distinct animals that get grown in the commercial sector. Um, because these millions of genetically distinct animals are themselves unique and have a relatively small individual footprint on global profitability of the agriculture industry, the, the breeders and the producers don't invest much um, resources in actually explicitly testing the performance of these individuals before they get deployed. Uh, so in animal breeding we spend very little amount of time really thinking about optimization of our product development process. Instead we spend an awful lot of time thinking about the, the, the population improvement piece. In contrast a traditional plant breeding program looks like this where you make some crosses, uh, you have lots of candidate progeny, then you start to evaluate these candidate progeny very lightly uh, you reduce the numbers of candidate progeny that get advanced down through these different stages of testing and as you go down through these different stages of testing you increase the precision or the amount of information that you collect on each of these individuals so that in the end you're left with a handful of individuals, for example 10 genetically distinct individuals in, in the UK wheat industry for example and those individuals get grown on very large areas so for example a wheat variety in Afghanistan could get grown on, on 10 million hectares, I'm, I'm led to believe, right? Uh, so the, the prize to the plant breeder to achieve this one, what they call mega variety, is sufficiently large that, large that plant breeders spend a lot of time trying to identify what is the single best genotype from their cohort of candidates. So they're really emphasizing the product development piece. Their population improvement piece is, is in some sense an accidental byproduct of the product development piece where at some point after they've tested lots of prospective varieties, they take some number and recycle them back to being the, the parents of the next generation. Traditionally this has invoked a very long generation interval in, in plant breeding programs. Uh, so, uh, Alison also mentioned the breeder's equation and, and I think it's a nice framework to think about how we optimize breeding. Uh, everybody knows it, it's got the accuracy of selection, the selection intensity, the diversity and the time leading to the response that you get in your breeding program. Uh, genomic selection which has been a, a, you know, a step change technology in our field, um, it, it's, it's useful in the context of genomic selection but basically as everybody knows it involves training a prediction equation and then using that prediction equation to rank selection candidates and take the best individuals forward to become parents of the next generation. And in the context of agriculture, this decouples the process of selection from phenotyping for the first time in the history of agriculture, which I think is a very important uh, thing because it allows us to do things that we couldn't do before. In the context of the breeder's equation, genomic selection is, is very useful because it can increase the accuracy of selection uh, it can reduce the generation interval because we don't need to wait for these phenotypes to be generated before we make selection decisions. And it can increase the selection intensity because it's cheaper to uh, genotype an individual than it is to phenotype it for most traits. Uh, so we use a lot of simulation in our group and I, I have a very simple simulation here but, but I think it kind of frames a lot of our thinking as a community in, in breeding in that we have some technology and if we want to deploy it in our breeding program, we need to think about how does that technology fit into the context of the breeder's equation. So imagine we had a technology like cheap genotyping that allowed us to increase selection intensity in some way. Uh, we, we could have selection intensities that are selecting 20% of the individuals to be parents of the next generation, 10%, 5%, or 1%. Uh, as we increment selection intensity, yes, we do get an increase in the response to selection, but pretty quickly we run out of we, we hit an asymptote, so we're not going to get a whole lot more benefit by incrementing selection intensity uh, much more. If we look at the accuracy of selection, so I should say this is the genetic gain on this axis and this is uh, 20 years of, of breeding or 20 generations of breeding, so this is the response to selection if you like over periods of time. And all of the four figures have the, the same, same axis and this is selection intensity, this is accuracy of selection, this is generation interval and this is genetic variance. If we look at the, the accuracy of selection, uh, so a very low accuracy of let's say 0.1 uh, has a very low genetic gain. If we increment it to 0.5 we get a nice bump, if we go to 0.7 we get even more and if we go to 1 we get 
even more. But if we, in our minds, now place an economic cost and say that the incrementing of accuracy is not linear in its cost, we can say, let's imagine it costs x to go from 0.1 uh, to 0.5. So that's a, something we might, we might be happy to do. But if it costs 2x to go from 0.5 to 0.7, that is something we might not want to do because the return on investment might become negative. Because it's expensive to increase accuracy all the way up to its absolute top value, it's not that expensive to increase accuracy from very low levels to modest levels. Uh, if we think about the gen generation interval, we can see that you know, having the generation interval doubles the rate of genetic gain. Everybody knows that this will be obvious. Uh, but if we're managing breeding programs, it's important to think, are we really shortening the generation interval to our biological minimum, minimum uh, at, at some relative cost? So it, it's pretty cheap, I would imagine, in many breeding programs to shorten generation interval more than it is currently uh, at. It might be a lot more expensive to really push it much further than, than what's currently done. But again, if you think in terms of the economic framework, you say, well, I, I should do something with generation interval. Finally, if we look at genetic variance, we can see that um, genetic variance, if I put in three different levels of genetic variance at the start, I get different levels of genetic gain. Uh, but perhaps we don't get a huge return on financial investment because it might be extremely expensive to increase the genetic variation in my population. Uh, and so therefore, it, it might not be a, a very effective lever to pull. So the breeder's equation is just a framework for allowing us to think about different technologies because there are different technologies that could enable us to play with each of these different parameters. So if we look at what has been achieved with the implementation of genomic selection, this is some data from the Dutch dairy cattle industry. So the, r the purple line here is their rate of genetic gain uh, over a, a long period of time. They adopted genomic selection here in 2008. Uh, prior to the adoption of genomic selection, they were making a gain on their index of 21 points per year. Uh, post the adoption of genomic selection, here they're making a gain on their index of 34 points per year. This is a 60% increase. Uh, in animal breeding, uh, well, sorry, we should say that if, if we think about how they have driven that increase in, in genetic gain through the, through the framework of the breeder's equation, we can see that actually it has come through shortening generation interval or, or through the, the time component. In animal breeding, there are four pathways through which we can make response to selection. There are the sires of sires, the sires of dams, the dams of sires, and the dams of cows. The sires of sires pathway is the important pathway in breeding programs because they're the sires that become important uh, in the breeding program itself. The dams of cows is not an important pathway because they're the, that's what individual farmers are doing to replace the, the cows in their own herds, right? What the Dutch did was they had a generation interval of about two and a half thousand day days on the sires of sires pathway prior to the adoption of genomic selection, and that became 1,250 days post the adoption of genomic selection. And it's this shortening of the generation interval of that pathway that has driven this 60% increase in the rate of, of genetic gain. In the pig industry, it wasn't possible to do that. Uh, but we have still seen spectacular increases in the rate of genetic gain in the pig industry. This was the genetic gain for PIC, which is the largest pig breeding program globally, uh, prior to the adoption of genomic selection. This is their genetic gain post the adoption. They had an initial once-off uh, massive step, but you really need to... Uh, in the pig industry, due to the way in which the pig industry is set up, it wasn't possible to shorten generation interval or to affect time. So instead, the way in which the pig breeders exploited genomic selection was to increase the accuracy of selection for traits that are measured late in the life of a female. So the num total number of pigs born, the number of stillborn, the, the, their survival the, to, from birth to weaning, et cetera, et cetera. And they almost doubled the accuracy of those traits or you know, 60, 70 percent increase in the accuracy of selection for those traits, which is what drove this extra genetic gain. So different species which have different biological constraints can use genomic selection in different ways. If we look now at plant breeding programs and think about how plant breeding programs could exploit genomic selection, so just to describe the basics of a, of a, wheat, a, a wheat breeding program in the UK, it could look like this where we have some number of parents, we make crosses, we produce what we call F1s, we then self these F1s, produce F2s, self those produce F3s, self again produce F4s all the way down to uh, let's say F10s, I think these are. Uh, as we go through this process of selfing and advancing, what we're doing is we are 
reducing the number of individuals that remain at each step, but we're increasing the accuracy with which each of these individuals is evaluated. So right at the start, we might have uh, 100,000 genetically distinct individuals, and we don't measure any phenotypes on them. But we might randomly advance 10,000 of them where they would get evaluated on a single plant basis for very traits that are very simple to measure, like evidence of disease on the leaves of the plant. As we go down through here, we might grow what we call head rows. So this would be, let's say, I think we have 6,500 individuals that would be grown here in head rows. These are small, one meter long by a half a meter wide plots. And we can measure more precisely things like disease on those plots, but we're not yet able to sufficiently measure or to measure yield with sufficient accuracy uh, to, to make a selection decision about yield at this head row stage. We can then take the individuals that get advanced from the head row stage to the, what we call the preliminary yield trial stage. So this might be a thousand individuals and these would get grown in plots that are maybe two meters wide by two meters long and we might grow two of those plots in two locations. So to get some accurate estimation of the performance of these individuals on a subset of the total locations that these individuals might ultimately be grown. We could then take the best 100 of those individuals and take them what we to what we call advanced yield trial stages, where we might grow them in very long, larger plots. I don't want to say six meters by six meters plots. Uh, we might grow 10 of these plots. Uh, sorry, we might grow four plots at a given location, and we might grow the, these plots in 10 locations, right? And we might repeat that process over two years. Finally, we will advance in 10 individuals, let's say, to what we call elite yield trial stages, where they might get grown on hundreds of locations, and they might get grown for three or four years. And, and then in the end, we'll release a single variety to, to, to the farmers, and it would get grown on 20% of the UK wheat growing area. So uh, if we think about genomic selection in the context of this breeding program, uh, the first thing we can say is that the, the, the generation interval is going to be very long in the conventional program because typically wheat breeders don't recycle individuals until they get down to here. So these are candidate parents. The best of these would get recycled back to become parents of the next generation, and that's a seven-year generation interval. Uh, with genomic selection, what you could do is say, well, I'm going to genotype my PYT stage where I have a thousand individuals um, and then I can do two things with those genotypes. I can use them to increase the accuracy of advancing individuals from here to here, uh, but I could also use them to shorten the generation interval for recycling. So instead of recycling from here back to here, I can now recycle from here back to here. So I would take one year off the generation interval. I also affect my selection intensity because here I've got a hundred individuals and I'm taking N from a hundred to go back to the parents. Here I have 1,000 individuals and I'll take N from 1,000 to go back here. Uh, unless my genomic selection model is very good, I may trade off some accuracy. So my PYT accuracy is going to be lower than my AYT accuracy unless I can get a genomic prediction model to compensate f in some way for that uh, loss of individual uh, phenotypic information. And this is basically what most of the plant breeding companies in the world did in their deployment of genomic selection was to genotype what they call the PYT stage. A more dramatic version of that would say, let's go to the head row stage where I've got six and a half thousand individuals. I can genotype all these six and a half thousand individuals, use my genotypes to advance to the PYT stage, and again to, ad again to advance to the AYT stage. Uh, but I could also use my genotypes to recycle individuals, in this case, two years earlier. So instead of here, I would now be recycling from here. And instead of taking N from 100, I would now take N from six uh, six and a half thousand. Uh, so, so there would be advantages here, but again, there would be disadvantages because the, the head row stage, the phenotypic information that I have is, is worthless for important traits like yield. Uh, so I would be entirely dependent upon my genomic prediction equation to give me any accuracy. Uh, so, but if you're an animal breeder and you've been trained that shortening generation interval is a good thing to do, you look at this process and you say, well, still, it's, it's wasting a lot of time. So you're selfing individuals from here all the way down to here, and then you're going to recycle them. That's five years in which you're, from a population improvement perspective, essentially doing nothing. And wouldn't it be better if you, if you essentially tried to recycle from here? And with that, we sort of propose this, uh, what we call a two-part strategy for the development of uh, inbred lines using genomic selection. 
and it's inspired a little bit by what the best of animal breeding has to offer and the best of what plant breeding has to offer. So it's got an explicit population improvement piece and an explicit product development piece. In the product development piece, you have crosses, you self and advance and test exactly the way a traditional plant breeder would do. Uh, you could use genomic selection here to genotype these individuals and also use it to advance. Uh, the only thing that's different between this breeding program and a, and a conventional breeding program is that the breeder is no longer allowed to make the crosses. So traditionally the breeder would make crosses from individuals that are selected from here. Now we're going to say no, the breeder is going to get crosses from the population improvement piece uh, where they're just injected in here. The population improvement piece, what it's going to do is recognizing that it's pretty cheap to use pretty cheap reproductive technology in crops to induce flowering quite rapidly in, in wheat. And you could do two cycles per year of your uh, crossing uh, if you use a glass house. So we could have a genomic selection scheme that's based entirely on genomic prediction and does two cycles of selection each year, rapidly turning these over. And then once a year, you take the best looking individual, or the best predicted individuals from this improved population, and you use them to start new individuals. The training set for this genomic prediction would come from this, uh, this data that you would be collecting here as part of the product development. So in theory, if, if we are traditionally taking a, a generation interval of one, uh, it, it takes seven years to do one generation, here we will be doing two generations of recurrent selection every year, so we would be 14 uh, cycles, if you like, per unit time faster than the traditional breeding program. And if cycle time is linear with uh, response to selection per unit time, then we would get 14 times more genetic gain per unit time. Uh, but we, 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 did, we compared all these four breeding programs in, in a simulation to see if there were any sort of nonlinear dependencies that prevented us from getting 14 times more genetic gain, and, and we saw these trends. So this is genetic merit on this axis. This is 40 years. Uh, the first 20 years, the breeder is running the conventional breeding program with the seven-year generation interval. Uh, the breeder can continue to do that for the next 20 years, and they would get this level of genetic gain, the black line. Uh, the breeder could deploy genomic selection uh, with this PYT scheme, which is what the traditional, what the global plant breeding programs basically did with genomic selection. So it's genotyping those PYTs. Uh, and you would get an initial bump in, in the rate of genetic gain, but then you, can, you have this line, and the slope of this line is not radically different to the slope of that line, although you do get more genetic gain. Uh, you could go to this head row scheme where it's shaving two years off the generation interval and it's genotyping the six and a half thousand individuals who are not phenotyped and you would get even more genetic gain by doing that. But if you went to this two part scheme where we fully decouple the population improvement and the product development processes, you get something like three and a half, uh, sorry, two and a half to four times more genetic gain per unit time and per unit cost uh, than you do that compared to the conventional breeding program. Um, so we were quite conservative with our um, assumption that you could do two cycles uh, per year. In wheat, it's possible to do even six cycles per year uh, if you, you know, really are aggressive in using glasshouse technologies. So we wanted to look at what, what the optimal number of cycles per year would be and, and would there be any benefits from further driving the, the generation interval. So here we have a fig figure again, it's the 20 years of, of genetic gain uh, uh, of various genomic selection programs. This is genetic merit. Uh, if this green line here represents if I did two cycles of selection per year, so it's the same as, as this red line on this picture. Uh, if I reduce the number of cycles uh, to one per year, I would get this green line. Uh, I should say that I'm going to imagine that I can use 3,600 plants uh, per year, and if I increase the number of cycles per year, I need to reduce the number of plants per cycle. So if I have 3,600, if I do one cycle per year, I'm going to have 1,800 if I do two cycles, and I'll have 300 per cycle if I do 12 cycles. And what we see is that if we increase the number of cycles per year, we get a massive increase in the rate of genetic progress achieved by the breeding program in the short term. But in the aggressive, really aggressive schemes, we very quickly, within five or six years, run out of the ability to make genetic progress and we hit an asymptote and we never make any more genetic progress and, and, 
as all animal breeders know, there's a very, and as all breeders know, there's a very simple explanation for that. We are, we, are going, we are running out of genetic diversity before we can turn that into diversity into genetic gain. So what we would really like to do with this picture is sort of take some of these redder lines and instead of having them asymptoting, we'd like to straighten them. So we might be prepared to make, pay a penalty in the short term so that we can preserve genetic variation and continue to make genetic gain in, in the long term. And there's a, there's a well-established technology for doing this called uh, optimal contribution selection. And I'll just describe essentially the framing of that. So the breeders have a continual dilemma. They want to maximize genetic gain uh, and they want to maximize the genetic diversity that's available in the population. Uh, genetic gain here is referring to short-term genetic gain. Uh, diversity here is referring to the amount of genetic variation in your population, and that's the fuel with which you will make long-term genetic gain. So in some senses, the breeder is trading off short-term genetic gain versus long-term genetic gain. And these two things are, are not positively associated with each other. They have a relationship like this, where um, you know, I can make a lot of short-term genetic gain, but to do that, I need to use up a lot of my diversity, and this is risky for the long-term sustainability of my breeding program. Equally, I could be over here where I want to preserve all of the genetic diversity in my population, uh, but I'm not going to make much genetic gain. More ideally is I would like to get most of the genetic gain, that I, most of the maximum genetic gain that I could achieve while maintaining most of the genetic diversity that I could maintain. And optimal contribution selection is a well-established technology for doing that. So we deployed this in a simulation to see if it, we could use it in the context of this rapid two-part genomic selection scheme. And this blue line now represents that line that I've been showing where we're getting two and a half to three times more genetic gain per unit time and per unit cost. But we're having this asymptoting property because we're running out of diversity uh, too quickly. Uh, that's if I use truncation selection, but if I switch to optimal contribution selection, I'm able to straighten this line and I don't really have to pay any penalty in the short term. Uh, in the plant breeding community, they also talk about another way to utilize or generate genetic diversity in their breeding programs. They, they talk about a concept of, called pre-breeding, which recognizes that in crops there are huge uh, collections of germplasm sitting in gene banks that are accessible to breeders. And in some way, you can take some of this diversity, put it through what we call a pre-breeding program, and then inject it into your population improvement piece, and, and through that, drive more long-term genetic progress. The problem with pre-breeding is that um, this genetic diversity is going to be some years uh, of, of breeding activity behind the, the genetic material that you've got in your breeding population. So let's imagine we are taking individuals from some heirloom varieties from, of, of wheat in the UK. And they might be more than 10 years old. Uh, so the breeding programs have made 10 years worth of genetic progress in the meantime, which means they're going to be ahead in terms of genetic potential. But these heirloom varieties may have some very useful alleles contained within them that if we reintroduce to our population improvement component could increase the diversity of that and ultimately drive more genetic progress. Uh, we could also have some stock varieties which might have be within our own set of germplasm from our own breeding program from, let's say, five years ago. Again, they would be somewhat behind the germplasm, uh, but they might be a little bit better than the heirloom varieties. Or we could have some uh, germplasm that we get from competitors. It might be a number of years ahead of us because they are a better breeding program. Or it might be that it's ahead of us, but it's not fully adapted to the geography. It might be from a slightly different geography that needs to be adapted to, to our local geography before it can be deployed. And we think that this strategy, which we call a four-part strategy, would allow us to do all of these things. So it would have a pre-breeding program, which is essentially doing rapid recurrent selection based on either phenotypes or genomics. And the purpose of that is to gather the useful alleles from these different sources and, if you like, package them into sets of parents that are enriched for these useful alleles. Then you can take the best of those individuals and inject it into what we call a, a bridging process, which is, again, the purpose of the bridging process is to mix up the good alleles from here with the best alleles that we currently have in our, in our breeding population. So you would take 
some of the best diversity from here, put it in here, some of the best diversity from here, put it in here, and allow it to mix up a little bit so that we can remove some of these bad alleles and enrich again for, for favorable adapted alleles. And then finally, we would in inject the best bits of that germplasm into our population improvement program so that it ultimately could affect our product development process and lead to new varieties. Uh, you can also think about this two-part strategy as a framework for integrating um, information and sharing germplasm across international or national breeding programs. And we're working with BioCrop Science to deploy this in their global breeding programs. And conceptually, this is, it's very simple. What it w could look like is we might have a, a pre-breeding or bridging program somewhere. We could have a centralized rapid cycle program, and then we can have regionally distributed two-part breeding programs, all of which share uh, information uh, about genomic prediction, but also share, share germplasm so that we can locally adapt uh, improved germplasm on a national scale to the needs of the local environment. Um, you can also think about this in the context of um, low and middle income countries. So this is a picture of the global, what they call the wheat mega environments. So they're the, the ecological niches, if you like, where different varieties of wheat do, do well uh, in differently globally. And uh, you could serve these by some interconnected system, which would deploy a technology called shuttle breeding in a different way. And I just want to show, describe to you how traditionally this has been done. So it, traditionally it has been done over here in this way, uh, led by an organization in the case of wheat called CIMIT, uh, who in invented a concept called shuttle breeding. Uh, and shuttle breeding essentially allows them to move, without using glass houses, you can test individuals in two locations in a given year because you can move uh, up and up, over and back across the equator, if you like, essentially across the equator, if you like. Uh, so traditionally, the way in which the CIMIT breeding program worked was it was, very, it was centrally located and very well resourced in the center. And you would have uh, lots of phenotypic evaluation of individuals uh, at the central location. And then a handful of the best individuals would get globally disseminated and tested globally. And if they performed well in any of the local regions, then they could be deployed in those local regions. Uh, and, and this is quite an inefficient process if you think about what we have available to us now in terms of genomic selection. So traditionally the germplasm has been moving, uh, but in the future we might think about, sorry, the finished germplasm, the, the almost plants that are becoming varieties that get grown on very large areas is what gets moved around the world. But, but nowadays what we might really want to move around the world is, is, is the genomic prediction equation. So instead of moving the germplasm, you could have um, partners, uh, national programs in each of the different countries that take um, individuals that are genotyped and phenotyped, test that, or sorry, produce individuals that are genotyped and, and phenotyped, produce a, a genomic prediction equation for their region, then that genomic prediction equation can be used at the global level to identify any useful individuals globally that could be imported as parents into this national program but also the, the genomic prediction equation can share information with all of the other genomic prediction equations that are calculated internationally to increase the accuracy of, of genomic selection for the entire network. And, and we're doing a little bit of work on thinking about how we would optimize, optimize that system. There's lots of open questions. So you know, if we have a system like this, how many breeding programs should they be? How big should each of them be? How should they share germplasm? How should they share data? If they were to operate or cooperate in a network, what would be the benefit from having them cooperate in a network? Uh, how do you model G by E across this system? And, and how do you define global and local breeding, pro breeding goals? So lots of open questions. Uh, so now I'd like to come back to animal breeding and, and talk about, Alison alluded to this earlier, but it's, it's a technology that I think uh, could be used in animal breeding, which, and the way in which I think it could be used is inspired a little bit by the way in which plant breeders do their business. So let's look at our, our animal breeding program here and, and recognize that we have a problem due to genetic lag. So uh, genetic lag is basically the difference in the genetic potential between individuals in the nucleus at a given time and commercial animals at a given time. And there are many different drivers of genetic lag. 
Uh, the first one is it could be as follows. So we have this distribution of candidates. We identify the top red portion. At the top red portion have some mean. Uh, and then it takes some number of years to take those top n, multiply them, and push them all the way down here. And by the time we do that, uh, the average of this from you know, today is going to be four years, let's say, behind the average of this distribution uh, in the future, because we will have shifted that distribution along by some amount. Uh, the multiplication process itself also induces a, a, a genetic lag, because the females that are already in this multiplier are descendants from a distribution that has, is itself some years back in this direction. So when you mix the, this year's germplasm with the mothers that are progeny of two or three years ago's germplasm, you dilute this year's germplasm, so you add some genetic lag. There's another element to the genetic lag, which is, which is uh, interesting, I think, is that the, currently we need to release you know, some portion of the top males into the multiplier layer to meet the needs of the industry. The average of the top N is going to be worse and could be considerably worse than the top single one individual. So instead of, if we were just releasing the top individual, we would have you know, this average four years later. Uh, if we are releasing the top N, we would have this average four years later. So there's an extra piece of genetic lag, which is the difference between those two lines. So we kind of calculate that um, there's something of order four and a half years worth of genetic gain in the genetic lag in the pig industry, and that it's even more if we were just to release the best male. As Alison said, surrogate sire technology allows us to do this. Um, essentially what you do is you remove the gonads from many males and then you replace those gonads with the gonads of the best individual male and then this allows you to disseminate the best male globally. I think about this as artificial in, uh, insemination on steroids. Alison used nicer language. Uh, or you can think about it as clonal propagation of the best single individual male. If we were to exploit this technology, we would have to use multi-stage testing approaches of plant breeding. And the reason we need to do that is we are going to disseminate globally a single individual animal. We need to be absolutely sure that that individual animal is going to do what we expect that it would do. Uh, as I think Alison already showed this, but the way in which it works is you take a donor male, you do some culturing of his uh, cells in his testes, then you transplant those cells into ablated recipient males. These are what we call our surrogate sires. Then you mate those surrogate sires to this, this female and produce these progeny. But in fact, although the mating is between these individuals, the progeny are actually descendants of these two individuals. And if you think about how we would dis deploy this technology in, in um, animal breeding programs, you end up reinventing this two-part concept that we, I talked about in, in plant breeding context a few minutes ago. It would have a population improvement piece, and it would have a product development piece. Uh, the population improvement piece would be rapid recurrent genomic selection as quickly and as accurately as possible to increase the mean of the population. And then periodically you extract some good males from this that would become sires. If they go through a conventional approach, what happens is you have a, a genomic test which has some degree of accuracy, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. You identify then the best 50, 200, or 500 males that exit the nucleus and enter the multiplication process. That's what currently kind of happens in pig breeding. If we use the surrogate sire technology, you could have a, a multi-stage testing approach. So the first stage of testing could be a genomic test that has some degree of accuracy. You could then follow up that with a, a second stage of testing, which is a progeny test of these animals where you could have a choice that you test many or few candidate uh, donor sires, and you would likely test them if you're testing many or intensively test them if you're testing few. And in the end, you could release a single uh, male or five males as, as donors. Uh, an alternative version of that is to have two stages of progeny testing. So stage one is a genomic test. Stage two is a progeny test where you test many candidates lightly. Uh, stage three is a progeny test where you test the few remaining candidates very intensively and then you release one or five individuals. Uh, and this is the potential or this is a, an approximation of the potential of this technology. So here would be the genetic merit of commercial animals at some period of time over a, a 10 year time frame, let's say. 
if I take the, let's take the blue line. So this is if, if I'm using my conventional breeding program and it's releasing 50 males from the nucleus into the multiplication herds each year, I would, ha I would end up with a, this level of genetic gain, if you like, at my commercial level year on year. Uh, if I release more, if I'm, my industry requires more males just to meet the numbers that I need, yeah, and say I release 200 or 500 males from my nucleus to my multiplier each year, my genetic merit is reduced somewhat because the average of the top 50 is better than the average of the top 200, and the average of the top 200 is itself better than the average of the top uh, 500. Uh, but if I look at my surrogate sire strategy and I use three stages of testing which we found was the best strategy, I would end up with this much genetic merit at my commercial level. And if we, uh, if we look at that in this way, we say the surrogate sire strategy gives us this much genetic merit in year 13. The conventional breeding program would take a further five years to give the same level of genetic merit. So we say the surrogate sire technology is worth something like five years, is delivering five years worth of, of genetic gain. Uh, and I need to remind ourselves that the, the, you know, the, the three-stage testing approach has a, it takes longer than a genomic test which is just releasing 50 individuals, right? It takes another, I think, two years to do this testing. Uh, so even accounting for that extra two years, we're still getting about five years worth of genetic gain at the commercial level. Uh, but if this was all true, the blueprint for breeding programs in plants and animals would become the same. I take here pigs and strawberries because strawberries are clonally propagated. They're, they're a bit, the plant breeders call them honorary animals because essentially you are releasing outbred individuals to the farmers, but you're able to clonally propagate those outbred individuals. And if we have surrogate sire technology, we would be releasing also outbred individuals to uh, the farmers but they would be clonally propagated in some sense, outbred individuals, because you are effectively clonally propagating the sires that give rise to the progeny. If this was true, the product development for both processes would involve finding the best clone, and the population improvement for both processes would be rapid recurrent selection. Uh, and you could have a breeding scheme that looks like this, where you make some crosses, you produce lots of candidates, you recycle the best individuals to produce more crosses, and you do that as quickly and as accurately as possible. And then you have this testing process where you take the best individuals, you clonally test them down through here. As you go down through these different stages of testing, you reduce the number of individuals that are being tested and you increase the precision with which they're being tested. So how am I doing on time? Uh, have I got 10 minutes? Okay. So I, I'll now switch to a, a little bit about some work that we did a few years ago on, on genome editing. Uh, and I just want to frame it by saying um, there's different ways of looking at genetic architecture in agriculture. There are some traits that are controlled by a single individual gene. Uh, for example, the, the classic PERS uh, resistance gene that Alison spoke about in pigs. It potentially is a single gene that gives the pig resistance. Uh, but most traits in livestock are highly polygenic. They're controlled by thousands of genes, uh, each with a small effect. And it's kind of obvious that genome editing would be very valuable for traits like this, and, and it is the case because we're seeing evidence of that in terms of the polled example or the PERS example. It's less obvious that genome editing would be useful for traits like this because you might have to do an awful lot of genome editing to have any impact on genetic gain in your breeding program. And we wanted to quantify how much editing we would need to do to see an impact on quantitative traits. So we proposed this strategy which we call promotion of alleles by genome editing, or PAGE. And it shows you how little we knew about molecular biology that we use the acronym PAGE, which is well established in molecular biology. Um, and so we chose this terminology also to distinguish from the concept of using genome editing to induce new or non-existing genetic variation into our population, as opposed to what we were trying to do, which was take alleles that are already present in our population and increase their frequency faster than selection can do. Uh, we wanted to quantify how much resources we would have to do to, to achieve this editing, you know, how many, or to, to achieve significant increases in genetic gain. So how many alleles we should edit per generation, how many animals we should edit per generation, 
and quantify any benefits or risks in terms of extra gain or impact on long-term response by affecting genetic variants. So we did a simple simulation. It had 100,000 years of random mating. Then it had 20 years of historical breeding where we had 1,000 candidates in each generation, 500 males, 500 females. All of the females get to reproduce and the top 25 males uh, get selected to, to become parents of the next generation. Uh, and we continue that for 20 years. Then we had a future breeding process which involved a further 20 years of breeding with the exact same s numbers over here. But the breeder now has the choice to edit some of these animals for some number of alleles. So he could edit or she could edit all fi top five animals, the top 10, the bottom five the, or the bottom 10, or all of the 25 sires that get selected. And he, could, he or she could edit these uh, animals for, for any number of edits up to 100 edits, uh, alleles. The trait that we simulated was controlled by 10,000 uh, QTN or causal variants and their effects were sampled from a normal distribution, so there were no what we might call big effect QTN. And we were surprised at the results uh, because it shows you really need a very, s relatively speaking, small amount of editing to achieve significant impacts on genetic gain. So this is genomic selection over 40 years. This is genetic gain, and, and genomic selection gives us this, this response. Uh, the CRISPR process, or the, the PAGE process, gives us this genetic gain, which is something like uh, it doubles, the rate of genetic gain is doubled at any time point, uh, uh, any comparison you make along these, in this time frame. And to achieve that, we only needed to edit 20 alleles per sire. So it, for a trait that was controlled by 10,000 causal variants, we could double the genetic, the genetic gain if we could uh, edit only 20 alleles per animal. Uh, a, a second benefit that we saw here is that the, the genomic selection genetic gain starts to asymptote, and that's because selection is quite inefficient at turning genetic variation into genetic gain in relative terms compared to genome editing, which doesn't have this asymptoting property because it's much more efficient. And you can kind of see why it's much more efficient here. Here we've got the 40 years of 40 generations, and these are the average allele frequencies of different categories of QTN. Uh, the solid lines here represent the changes in allele frequencies for all 10,000 QTN that affect the trait. And what we see is that se um, selection, the red line, sorry, the, the blue line, which is hidden underneath, but it's there, uh, doesn't really change the allele frequencies on average across these 10,000 QTN that much. The genome editing, where we're editing the animals for 20 alleles doesn't really change the, the average change in allele frequencies that much either. But if we look at the QTN which have the largest absolute effect size, so these will be the top 20 QTN, we see that selection can pick up these QTN and start to increase them and drive them to uh, fixation. It's quite good at, at getting most of those alleles to fixation, but at some point it hits an asymptote. And that's essential. what's happening here essentially is that 16 of the QTN get fixed by selection, but four of the QTN get lost from the population before selection can drive them to fixation. Because of linkage drag with, with other maybe negative QTLs, or more likely simply because of drift, because in livestock breeding, our effective population sizes are small, and, and drift is a real problem. In, in contrast, the, the genome editing approach is able to pick up these QTN, and within two or three generations, it's able to fix all of them. So genome editing from this metric uh, is much more efficient and effective at deploying genetic variation and turning genetic variation into genetic gain. And this is something I think we need to speak more about in terms of the positive value of genome editing. Uh, so if we looked at our simulation, we said, well, um, we could double the rate of genetic progress with a modest amount of edits uh, over a 20-year process. But we would need to set up a, an allele discovery system that would allow us to discover the required number of causal variants to achieve this. Uh, and the first thing we needed to know was how many variants would we need to, to identify uh, if we were to achieve this doubling over 20 years. And we could quantify that by looking at the number of distinct causal variants that we edited. So over the 20 years, we only edited 314 distinct causal variants. This is 3% of all 10,000 causal variants. This amounts to about 15 variants per year. And if you think uh, that's actually not that many, it starts to become a number that is tractable. 
However, we need to recognize that we've been trying to find genes in livestock for a long time, and, and we've had modest success. So whatever strategy we've been using in the past to find causal variants will not give us you know, 15 per year. So I'd like to propose an alternative strategy, which I want to stress there's absolutely nothing new here other than a little bit of philosophy. And that's really a quantitative geneticist's approach to molecular biology. And if I could make a distinction, molecular biologists are really concerned about the fundamental mechanisms of what causes why a gene, how a gene acts. Quantitative geneticists are kind of the great approximators in biology. They don't really care about the specifics of anything in particular. They just want to tilt the probabilities in their favor. And with that in mind, I, I, I propose this approach. Uh, so there's a couple of things in this approach. The first one that says I need to double my, to double my rate of genetic progress. I need to identify 15 new variants every year. Uh, and I could do that by having some filtering process. And then instead of editing only 15, I could start to say, well, I'll edit 100 variants in every animal. Uh, and out of those 100, I want that 15 be causal and positive. And I just want to make sure that the remaining 85 are not deleterious. And if I could achieve that, I would double the rate of genetic gain in my program. Uh, so this is how that scheme could look like. Um, I'll call it an allele testing scheme, and it's a process to gain the odds. There's a few things that I should highlight. I'll call it allele testing because in animal breeding, traditionally, we did progeny testing. In the future, we might do allele testing. My allele testing scheme involves a funnel. Plant breeders often talk about the, breeder, the breeding funnel, where they feed in at the top lots and lots of candidate varieties, and then they try and whittle down these candidates into a handful of candidates that get grown uh, as real varieties on farmers' fields. And they call this process the breeding funnel. Uh, so we could use the same process to identify our causal variants. So my assumption might be that I have 25 million segregating sites in my pig genome. 10,000 affect my trait. 1,000 of these act in a simple additive way. I want to edit 100 in my sires, and I want 15 of those 100 to be coming from this sample of, or this set of 1,000. Um, I set up my funnel. I spill my 25 million variants into my funnel. I do some form of GWAS screen. Let's say a million variants survive this GWAS screen. I then could follow it up with an expression QTL study in some way. 100,000 variants might survive that expression QTL study. I could then combine that with some functional annotation. 10,000 variants might survive. I could do some in, vi in, in vitro screening. Uh, 1,000 variants might, might survive that screen. I could do an in vivo test, 500 edits might survive there. Finally, I'm left with 100, which I put in my real pigs, and 15 affect my trait. Uh, as we go through this process, I'm increasing the proportion of causal variants that are in my subset. I start off with a very small proportion, and I hope to end up with about 15%. A second thing I'm doing as I go through here is I'm increasing the probability that any of these variants that survive are not highly deleterious. Uh, some of these tests may not be useful for that information, but for example, the, the, the real in vivo testing might be. So I want to show, we, we've started off trying to, we're trying to do this. Uh, we've put lots of resources uh, and infrastructure in place to do it. Um, but I want to describe a little simulation which we're using to kind of give us a little bit of hope that this might work. So in our research group, we have in two species, uh, in each of the species, we have about a half a million animals which have phenotypes and have highly accurately imputed whole genome sequence. In pigs, for example, we have 375,000 pigs which have imputed whole genome sequence with a 0.98 accuracy. Uh, so imagine we could use a data set like that for GWAS. How powerful would it be in the context of allele testing? So we did a GWAS with a million animals, um, and I'm going to present the results for 1% of the genome, this little window here. In this little, little window, I've got uh, 85,000 neutral variants and 84 causal variants. And I want to see, is my GWAS able to discover these 84 causal variants? So these are my results. The black dots represent the neutral variants, all 85,000 of them. And the red dots, which are probably hard to see, represent the causal variants. I've got my significance threshold here. Uh, and if I go and look above my significance threshold, I have four significant causal variants, 
for those with good eyesight, there's a red dot there, there's a red dot there, and I think there are two red dots there. Uh, and I've got 256 uh, false positives. So if I, take, if I randomly sampled a variant from this window my pr and then entered it into my allele testing scheme, my pre-GWAS ratio, or likelihood of success if you like, I would have 84 out of 85,000 would be causal, or one out of every thousand that I, that I would sample. But post my GWAS, my ratio or my odds have increased significantly in my favor. Uh, four out of 260, if you like, of these significant variants are causal, so that's one out of 65. So if I extrapolate that genome-wide, I would end up with a, a GWAS that discovers 400 causal variants, uh, but also discovers 25,000 false positives. Uh, I needed to discover 314, and I need this 25,000 to be, to be much less. So for, for, to enable PAGE in this context, the remaining steps of the allele testing process needs to reduce these 25,000 to about 3,000 and to ensure that they're not deleterious. And, and we're hopeful that we might be able to achieve that. How am I doing on time? A uh, few minutes, okay. So I'll very quickly describe the, the sequence data set that we have generated. Um, so our... The, the, the answer at the end will be we have lots of sequence data and it's accurately imputed, but I just want to talk you through the journey through which we have generated this data set. Um, so you can have different philosophies when you generate sequences. You can do what we call high coverage whole genome sequence of a subset of animals um, and hope that that subset of animals represents the, the population you've got, but it won't because it's only a subset of the animals. So lots of the haplotypes in your data set will not be captured in this subset. An alternative approach is to say, let's sequence everybody at very low coverage uh, and hope that we capture the haplotypes in the whole population by sequencing those individuals at low coverage. Uh, a process here could be, for example, sequencing these individuals at 2x, then deriving from those individuals sequence data, high coverage consensus haplotypes, and then back imputing those haplotypes into these individuals. And we would end up with highly accurate, high coverage whole genome sequence for all of these individuals. Uh, so we, we set about doing all of this. We had a prototype algorithm that could do that process, and it, invo it, it, it performs this w in this way. So these are haplotype frequencies in our sires. So how common is a haplotype? So this haplotype is carried by, it's present 120 times in our data set. Uh, these haplotypes over here are, are present, you know, one or two times. Uh, our algorithm is able to, if we s distribute sequence, sorry, I should say, uh, if we if we had 1819 sires and we sequenced those sires at 1x, it means we would have about 2000x of sequence distributed across this data. And then we can see how well are we able to phase and impute the alleles in the haplotypes that are carried in the population. And if a haplotype is very common, carried by 120 sires, we are able to phase and impute it perfectly. If it's carried by about 20 animals, uh, we're still able to phase it and impute it almost perfectly. But if it's less frequent, we're not doing such a good job. Uh, so, but overall, we're able to recover about 68% of the alleles uh, in this data set by this process. Uh, um, but we could optimize the distribution of resources slightly differently. We could say, let's take the sequencing resources that we're overspending on these haplotypes and spend them on these haplotypes so that we increase the resources on these haplotypes to, to get them above this threshold. Equally, we could accept that we'll never be able to accurately infer the sequence of these haplotypes. Could we take the resources away from these and place them in this area to get more of these haplotypes above this threshold? And if we did that, we could increase this number above 68%. Uh, so we had a little algorithm that could do that kind of logic. Um, and if our tre threshold for being able to phase and impute the alleles on a haplotype is accumulating 20x of sequencing on the haplotype, a random distribution gets 21% of the haplotypes above that 20x threshold. But with a little bit of moving of resources around, we're able to get about 70% of the haplotypes uh, above that threshold. So we have deployed that. We have also deployed a second algorithm, which I don't want to go into the details of, which says who should we sequence and at what coverage we should sequence them and their immediate relatives because these particular individuals that we're focusing on are animals that have bigger footprints on the population. Uh, the headline is that this algorithm works. 
uh, it produces a list like this, which says you should sequence these animals at 20x, these animals at 10x, these at 5, these at 2, and these at 1. These should remain unsequenced. If you put all that together, you end up with a distribution of sequencing across our population, uh, and then we would need to impute the sequence back. Uh, there wasn't really an algorithm available to us that could do this in the way that we needed it to do it, so we recognized that it could be solved with, uh, with peeling, uh, with what we call hybrid peeling for fast, accurate calling, phasing, and imputation of sequence data of any coverage in pedigree. It has four simple insights. It recognizes that animals in pedigrees share haplotypes. Thus, you should call the genotypes for all of the animals jointly, rather than what is traditionally done by calling the genotypes of sequence data for each individual separately. You could do this with multi-locus peeling. Uh, traditionally, peeling used, uses called genotypes. When you have variable cover sequence coverage sequence data going from 1 to 30x, uh, you don't have called genotypes at all marker positions, but you can overcome that by modifying the penetrance function in peeling so that it can account for the read depth at any particular position. If you end up doing that in a multi-locus peeling a process, you have an algorithm that does all of this, but it's computationally intractable. So the next insight we had was that recombination is re very rare. A big part of the computational load in um, multi-locus peeling is calculating segregation indicators. Given that recombination is relatively rare, you can calculate these segregation indicators uh, very sparsely, only at a fraction of the marker positions along the genome. If you do that, you end up with an algorithm that's able to do all of this, but which is computationally tractable for data sets of hundreds of thousands of animals. This is the performance of an algorithm in a real data set, which had 60,000 animals. All except for the base animals, this is, the animals are sorted by generation number, if you like. Uh, this is the accuracy of imputation of the sequence data. Except for the base animals, which don't have any ancestors sequenced, which makes it hard to impute, we're able to get extremely high accuracy of imputation for the whole pedigree of order 0 0.98, 0 0.97. Uh, computational time, about 24 hours for about 80,000 animals. So we can now do uh, low coverage sequence on livestock populations and get highly accurate whole genome sequence in return for large populations. We've deployed this in a real program with no, uh, nine breeds. We, we sequenced 8,000 individuals. They were mostly at 1 and 2x. Across the 8,000 individuals, we had uh, 32,000 x of sequence in total. Uh, these were 60 million, bio, it resulted in 60 million biallelic SNPs, which we were able to impute into a pedigree of this size. Um, I won't go into the, the last topic because I think I've, I've overrun my time. Uh, so on the pig side of things, we, we are now analyzing this data in the context of genomic prediction, but also in the context of allele testing. Uh, so in conclusion, um, the two-part strategy for crops can give you two to four times more, rate, more genetic gain than conventional breeding programs. Surrogate sire technology, depending on how you cook the numbers, can give six and a half to 9.2 years worth of extra genetic gain at the commercial level. Uh, genome editing for quantitative traits, which we call PAGE, could double the rate of genetic gain, and allele testing is a framework that could allow you to discover the causal variance in the needed throughput. Uh, we and others are assembling data sets and technology to enable us to, to try and do this. Um, also, I would like to emphasize the step change cultural shifts. So the blueprints uh, for plants and animals are becoming, e plant and animal breeding programs are becoming equal. This will mean that the skills, the approaches, the communities, etc., will begin to merge. This is pretty good if you're interested in getting a job in, in our field because it now opens you up to a much broader set of jobs than traditionally were available. Uh, and as we go forward, we need even more integration of plant breeding, animal breeding, molecular, quantitative genetics, and reproductive technologies. Uh, sorry for going over the time, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. I invite the speakers of this morning to go to this stage so we can discuss a little bit. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, guys, we are open to questions. We had a very intensive uh, morning, but a lot of information. Thank you for all. Of the, we have a very, very, very nice morning. Okay, I'm open. We are open to the questions. Um, my question is to John and Allison. Uh, I've heard that uh, surrogate sire technology will be mature in about three or four years. Um, from, I think that was um, the guy from Roslyn, uh, Ian Wilmot. No, he died. <laughs> uh, well, he said that at PAG it was three to four years. Uh, how would that fit into the uh, uh, regulation, surrogate, sire technology? Um, it depends how you uh, render the surrogate sire infertile. There's two ways to do it. You can irradiate the germ cells and kill them that way, which does not involve genetic technology, but it, it does beat up the animals to some extent. So if you didn't use genetic technology to produce infertile males to be the surrogate sires, it would fall outside of the regulations. In the currently proposed regulations in the United States, the EU, um, where you've got a knockout that's induced by, um, in the germ cell differentiation pathway by genome editing, it would be considered a GMO or a new animal drug. Um, whereas in Brazil and Argentina, um, you, you would not trigger. And actually Australia, you wouldn't either because it's a knockout, it doesn't involve a template. So you'll have some ability to use it in some countries and then other countries with non-risk-based regulatory approaches, you won't be able to use it. Just as an information, is uh, George Yasu here? I don't think so. Didn't see him. He works with this kind of technologies in, in endangered species of fishes. Mm -hmm. the, he made the transplant of, of uh, germ cells from one species to the other ones. And that's working really well. Next question. Very nice session, thank you. I was just curious uh, on the possibility of the doing uh, the editing in other countries. How do you think would be the importation of milk from Canada in the States, if you think about the fish story? Okay, so I'm gonna speak specifically to the US regulations where it's a drug, right? Um, and so I've asked the FDA that because <laughs> It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if Canada has edited high merit Holsteins with no horns, that semen will get imported. And what I was told was, if we're going to keep pretending that they're drugs, the US has um, drug uh, residue levels for non-approved animal drugs in the United States to import meat or milk from other countries. So if there's a product approved in Brazil that's used to treat animals, there's a certain threshold level, let's say, I don't know, 0.1% of, of whatever the residue level is. So if you think about 202 base pairs divided by 3 billion, that's a really low number. It's below 0.001%, so it would I would think be under the threshold level for an unapproved animal drug in the United States. So I think it would be able to be imported. Um, I, I don't, we haven't tested that hypothesis, but that would be a logical end point if we're gonna consider that these things are drugs. Except that if they do a, a test in the milk with a DNA, it would be 100% contamination. Well, If the, you get the milk from Canada, it would be 100% edit it if you get from a, a cow that's from, in the horn. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. It's, but it's, it's just crazy because there's nothing in the milk, but I understand that. Yeah, it's well, just, I, I just don't understand how the regulation works because that impact how other countries develop technology that can be used to export to the States or Europe. The, the somatic cells would still be in the milk. 
but each cell would have three billion base pairs, so the residue of the three billion base pairs would still be the 202 base pairs, right? So, and, and it's going to be complicated because there are, as I showed, small numbers of naturally occurring Celtic alleles in the Holstein and Jersey populations from long ago introgressions, and so just finding that allele in milk is not evidence that that's coming from editing, it might have come from the natural introgression. And it, it just brings up how silly this approach is. Questions? Here. Wonder about this surrogate transfer of uh, germ cells. One can produce uh, pr primordial germ cells from female lines and also produce sperms out of it. Do you think that might be able to somehow to do this and get a bull that will produce only female spermatozoid or experienced spermatozoid? You again? Yeah. <laughs> you, well, you need. You need extra, um, you can't produce fertile sperm in the absence of Y chromosome um, because there's some, some genes on the Y chromosome that are required for fertile spermatogenesis. Uh, so it'll be a little bit more complicated to do that. All males, we could probably do. I don't know. Okay, people look like hungry and tired for, from the churrasco, yeah, maybe. Okay, guys, let's move, let's have lunch, and then we we'll go back in this afternoon. I'm really glad for the three presentations. We had very nice and broad view of what can happen in the future, but also Fabio took us to the real life and see how important it is to do research thinking about the consumer. This was really important. Thank you for this section. Have a good lunch. <laughs>